Hi, Lisa. Is anyone there? Yeah, Joyce is here. Joyce. Oh, I was going to run over. I thought maybe you weren't starting the video. We, you know, we got a little bit late because we uh, we had a deanery meeting this evening over at Macklin Heart of Mary. So we just got back from that. So we started a little bit late, but we're here. So uh, again, welcome to the Bother the Father. Um, I'm your host, Father Mark Madden. Um, so we'll just open up any, this is open forum. So any questions you may have, just go ahead and uh, start. I have a question if Joyce doesn't have one. I don't have one, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, so for Easter, Grant and I watched the Passion of Christ movie. And I know it's Hollywood and I'm sure there's, you know, liberties taken for dramatization and whatnot, but we still wanted to watch it. And I, I just have this nagging feeling ever since I watched this. I don't, if this, if this went on for 12 hours, why did no one do anything? No one did anything. Um, so it's, it's interesting about that, that particular movie is they kind of say that's actually the most accurate portrayal of what it actually was like for Jesus. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, so there's a few things that you call it Hollywood, but um, actually Mel Gibson was actually pretty true to not only history, but also the text of the Bible. Um, so for one thing, um, Probably the most brutal scene, of course, is the uh, is the uh, the scourging of the pillar, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I know I can't get through that scene without tearing up at some point, right? And I think it's interesting that um, a lot of people think like, well, the, well, the real punishment there is like forty lashes. But you notice they didn't give him just forty lashes. They were counting out how many times they would do it, and uh, traditionally in the, in the Roman Empire. It was, um, they would beat the person until the cohort got tired. So in other words, the cohort was that little band of, of soldiers. Right. And so they would just take turns beating the person until the people beating him got tired. And that was actually pretty accurate. Because what you notice there is that they were trained these two guys just beating Jesus. Then they flipped him over and kept on doing until they were tired. So it wasn't necessarily 40 lashes. It really was how many that was done um, until the person, the people beating him couldn't do it anymore. Um, the other thing that's kind of uh, interesting, and I think this is kind of true too, is uh, the kind of the unwillingness of Pilate to want to actually condemn Jesus. Now, part of that was because of his, his wife, Claudia, right? He had these kind of premonitions about Jesus and really was kind of advising him, stay away from this guy. You know, it's going to be trouble if you do anything with them. Um, but the reason that, that, that Pontius Pilate had him scourged was because the intention was to let him go after that. Right. Because typically uh, people that were scourged wouldn't survive it afterwards. They may survive after, like immediately afterwards, but eventually their wounds and their, their injuries would make them succumb to, to, to the, the internal bleeding and everything else going on with that person. But it seemed like he wasn't even paying attention and even they didn't follow his instructions and his like soldiers would pop in once in a while and say like, stop, right. and then they'd be gone again. Yeah, and, and that, that may have been the Hollywood because nowhere in the scriptures say like Punches Pilate was like, oh, do it lightly. <laughs> you know, yeah, basically yeah. the idea was to have him scourged once they see how bruised and bloodied he is, who wouldn't have compassion on the guy to say, don't kill him. Right. Um, as far as we know, Jesus was the only person in the entire history of the Roman Empire to not only go through scourging, but also crucifixion. And the reason being is because it was considered unjust for someone to go through both. Mm -hmm. Right. And so a lot of that was pretty true to the way the Roman Empire ran things, to history, tradition, as well as the scriptures. Um, so yeah but the your question why didn't anyone do anything well i think that part of it was that was part of god's plan right the fulfill, jesus came to fulfill all the scriptures and what's what's funny is um during the entire passion we have jesus actually kind of he's actually reciting psalms right and part of what the psalms say is that you know i i am a man rejected by all right everyone has left me 
when he was on the cross, he was reciting actually Psalm 22, right? They've actually, they've actually, uh, they would uh, dig holes in my hands, and my feet. I can count all my bones. Um, I have, I have, uh, uh, I am alone, uh, no one here to help me. So when Jesus says, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's actually praying. He's not saying like, God, you've abandoned me. He's actually praying Psalm 22, which funny enough is actually the Psalm that we would pray during daytime prayer on the third Friday of the Psalter, which would have fallen on Good Friday. So uh, we have that in our liturgy, of course, but, but uh, yeah, that was, that was kind of, that was kind of Jesus fulfilling that prophecy that the Messiah would have to suffer, die and be abandoned. And so that's what happened. But the, but the humans observing this didn't know that's God prophecy and how can they stand and watch that? Well, okay, but here's the thing. Um, we're told in script in the Bible, in the, in the gospel, though, like when um, when they're getting ready to actually, you know, condemn Jesus and arrest him and get ready for his crucifixion, we're told very specifically that Caiaphas, the high priest, made a prophecy that it's better for one man to die than the entire nation to be destroyed. And so, what what you could say is a self fulfilling prophecy in some way, but Caiaphas called this. He had full intention of actually sacrificing Jesus for the good of the people. Now, and Caiaphas was a, he was a high priest, so he would have known the scriptures just as much as anybody else. And so you could even make the argument that, well, you know, Caiaphas, Judas, all these people did know, and they were actually just playing their part in God's will. I mean, and, and really, this comes, really, the person of Judas is a very interesting figure when we talk about it in the Catholic Church, because, of course, the church never condemns anyone to hell, and Judas would be no exception. As a matter of fact, in some of the Eastern churches, they venerate Judas as a saint. And the reason being is because, well, they, they think, the thought would be, well, he must have had some repentance before he killed himself, but also he fulfilled God's plan. He fulfilled the role that he was actually given in God's plan. To, now, it just so happened to be that he, he was supposed to betray Jesus. Sure now we're good <laughs> <laughs> so it's better push it so i just clear the garage yeah i, I, I yeah you didn't have time it's good it's downstairs if you want. <laughs> no we well we were doing out here it's a little nicer outside so we can try so yeah so really um we talk about these figures in the old in the um in the time of jesus like that were there um yeah i mean Look at the figures that were there at the president of the cross. Only the only people that were there for him at the very end was John, his mother, and Mary Magdalene. Mm -hmm. And three people against the entire Roman army and the Sanhedrin, there's not much you can do. But the even the blessed mother, she knew this had to happen. I mean, when she said yes or gave her fiat at the Annunciation. She knew that the, the son of man, the savior had to die. That the savior had to suffer and die. She knew that and still said yes to it. Now she may not have known all the details of that, but she surely knew that this was going to happen in her life. Otherwise it wouldn't be a free yes she was giving. Right. And God would never do that to us. He wants us to be completely informed when we actually uh, are given the task by him. And Mary, of course, being that she was without sin, she was in a state of original grace. She would have known that too. So yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, we could definitely say <laughs> here 2000 years later, wow, I would have been there and I probably would have done something. But here's the thing. I, I don't think we could truly say that. I don't know. You know, you, you would hope that we would, but if we did and succeeded, the mission fails, mm -hmm. right? And we, in, in reality, we're actually working against God's will in that respect. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, the visuals of that movie were really uh, rough. 
uh, yeah. And I mean, and that's what, that's also kind of the brilliance of it. Cause just, I mean, that probably was the most accurate depiction of how it actually was. Hmm. And so you think about it, it's hard to think about because like, you don't want to think of that much suffering happen to anybody. Mm -hmm. um, but that just shows us also, I think, who Jesus truly is. I, I don't think any human being could have endured what Jesus endured for as long as he endured and survived. Right. It's just impossible. And so I think all that shows an affirmation of who Jesus is. That he truly is who he says he is. Meaning he says he's God. Well, I'm prone to believe him based on just the, just the scourging alone would have probably been enough for anyone to die. Yet he still bore his cross for a mile and a half after doing that and then hung on the cross for three hours. So, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's probably, he probably is who he says he is. The, the, the parts where he was with the disciples and um, I, they actually used it in Latin yeah. and he, he was talking about, uh, that was pretty powerful in, in a more positive way. Yeah. Than the, than the graphic violence, but. Um, and I understand that apparently that was a, a uh, apparently Mel Gibson didn't want to use subtitles at all. That was actually added later and he had to be convinced of that because he thought the subtitles would take away from the drama and the actual, like the actual um, um, realness of it. So yeah, I read that, but I, if we had watched it without subtitles, I wouldn't have understood. Well, I could figure it out. <laughs> I would have a sentiment of a feeling for it, yeah. but it, it was more meaningful to me that I could understand. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I think it's, it is, I mean, but that's actually such a story that you knew what, you would have known what's going on, I think, by yeah. watching what's happening. Yeah. Right. So, is it yeah. in the scripture that that the that the men who actually nailed him to the cross were were they drinking as he portrayed in the movie? Does it oh, say very that? possibly. I mean, because well, you have to understand though too, um, the common drink for people, and we still see that in some cultures today, was wine. Mm. Right. So water was not only scarce in the desert. Oh. Finding like a good source of water was also kind of a, a problem. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's funny if you go if you go to Israel today, I'm sure it's probably cleaner back then. But the Jordan River is disgusting. If you ever like went to the banks of the Jordan River, it's probably worse than River to Pear, as far as just like the muck and the the it's it's not good water to drink. Right. So the 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 drink that people would, in Rome and also in Jerusalem would be they would just drink wine because it was probably cleaner. You knew it was sterile right and you're less prone to get disease so it's very possible that maybe they were that thirsty i mean the, the sun was hot they're getting a little you know they're, they're waiting for this this guy to get up this hill there you know it's like okay let's take more drink sure it's very possible interesting yeah but no I, we're not told in scripture if that actually was the case that the actual the actual soldiers were drunk I think that was a that was probably more of a, a, a artistic license, and really you could say, well, it probably could have been, could have been true, you know. There's nothing scripturally to support that, but realistically speaking, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it'd be it'd probably easier to believe that because the amount of brutality necessary to do that to a human person, you would hope that someone was not in their right mind when they were doing that. So. I would, I would, I would say hopefully they were <laughs> in some way. Um, mm. Otherwise, wow, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty harsh. Mm. Good. They clean, cleaned up statues then. I mean, you know. Oh yeah. As, as there's a, there's a Franciscan tradition. They have the, um, they call it the suffering Christ. And actually it's a, it's a crucifix with like just scars and slashes and you can see bones. I mean, it's very gory, but that's actually some, some, some of the different orders have traditions of that being like their, their crucifix they would use. So you can find them, they're around. Um, but yeah, it, it like a lot of, a lot of stories like the, the great story ever told or like, a lot of the, yeah, they clean it up quite a bit. 
and part of that's probably because, well, you, you notice that the Passion of the Christ is rated R. It's rated R because it was that gory and gruesome. Whereas other things are rated PG because they put them on TV. And you couldn't, you couldn't necessarily show that on TV. So yeah, they're cleaned up quite a bit. Even our, yeah, our statues too, of course, yeah. The one we have in our sanctuary. Yeah, he didn't look like that. <laughs> I mean, we were told very specifically that he was unrecognizable, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Which also may be interesting because, you know, right now during Easter, we're talking about a lot of these uh, Gospels we're reading in daily Masses on, on Sundays. It's interesting that the Apostles and these people don't recognize Jesus. So part of that could be because, well, there may be a distinction between our glorified body and our body here on Earth that maybe that's one of the reasons. Um, but also, too, that maybe he was so, it was so unintelligible until he was, that even his glorified body, that still bears some of the resemblance of that. Not that it was like gruesome and gory, but his glorified body is almost unrecognizable as it was on the cross. So who knows? Um, that's one of the mysteries of faith. We don't really know what our body is going to look like in the afterlife, um, which is one of the reasons why maybe Jesus was they were, they were confused whenever they saw him. And it wasn't until actually he, told, he actually um, called them by name or gave them some kind of task um, that they actually realized who he was. And that could be because his glorified body was unrecognizable. I don't know. Hi, Paul. Good evening. Hi, how are you? Any other questions, comments, concerns, heresies? You got all you know. I got there, Lisa. You're good. I got, I got more, but I, I try to save just stick to one a session. <laughs> Otherwise, I take up all the time and then yeah, I leave. Yeah. No, one, no one's bringing anything up yet. So, if you got another one, go for it. <laughs> well, I mean, to that end, we when you were talking about the um, the most of the statues have been cleaned up, um, we were looking at. I guess there's one in Lebanon that actually shows the blood, like his flesh yeah. had been yep. torn off. And then, so then that brought up the discussion of um, if he was really white. And I guess there was a book written on that. And he partnered with like a um, Israeli anthropologist or something. And they determined that it was honey olive skin that would be more in line yeah. with uh, Jewish, uh, Jerusalem, yeah, Jewish. Um, yeah, so you know, there's there's a question about like you know why do we have all these different depictions of Jesus in different colors, different races? Well, part of that's because I think the artists they t tend to um, depict Jesus in a way that they can actually recognize, right? So um, Jesus, obviously being God, he wouldn't necessarily have a race, but his manhood he does, and his DNA is very you know all his attributes would have been given to him by mary and mary was a palestinian jewish woman in the eastern mediterranean so she probably would have been of olive like skin like darker skinned um and also would everyone else in her her family and also everyone else in her neighborhood probably were in that same kind of depiction so yeah jesus probably would have been look like maybe it's what a lot of the middle eastern people look like today um, and so, yeah, we would definitely say that would be the case. So then why is he depicted all these different ways? Well, part of that is so that we can actually maybe identify more with him in that respect. So it's much easier to identify with someone that looks like you than someone that doesn't. And since everyone can identify with Jesus, it makes sense that he's depicted in different ways um, that we can actually identify with him in a deeper way. Um, What's interesting is like, uh, so we just celebrated Divine Mercy Sunday and they've done actually studies. They've actually um, taken the, the image of the Divine Mercy and compared it to the Shroud of Turin. And what's very fascinating about that is that it lines up very per like perfectly with, um, they line up with their bone structure, with like kind of their, their features. And so it kind of gives more credence that, you know, the Shroud of Turin actually probably was the burial call of Jesus. Um, but also, the, the, you notice that the, the divine mercy is kind of depicted as 
sort of a more of a uh, Polish looking person. Well, yeah, that's probably because St. Faustina Kowalska, who witnessed this, was Polish, right? And this devotion started in Poland. Um, this becomes even more pronounced when we look at the different Marian appearances over history. So whenever Mary has appeared to somebody, she usually, ta she usually takes the appearance of the people she's appearing to. So for instance, um, Our Lady Guadalupe, um, she actually has the appearance of a mestiza woman, meaning a, a kind of a, a combination between a Spanish and a native Aztec that would have been living there at the time. So she's kind of an amalgamation of those two races. And she appears at a time where the Spanish conquest is going on in Mexico. So what that tells us, she's trying to take the appearance of the people living there at the time to show this kind of combination of cultures. And so you can actually, the people there could appeal to and actually identify with. Um, when she appears in Ireland, she looks Irish. I mean, so it's, it's, she's done this every single time she's appeared. She's taken on the appearance of the people that are there. And so because Jesus is universal, it would make sense that his depictions are also kind of appealing to the people that they're, they're, they're in, the people where they're living in those places. So it wouldn't be, a, yeah, if you have a black Jesus, fine. Or if you have a Chinese Jesus, fine. Or if you have a white Jesus, fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But yeah, but we would say that uh, biologically speaking, he would have had the features of a Palestinian in the, Met, in the Eastern Mediterranean um, that probably take on the same appearance of a Middle, Middle Eastern man today. So sure, that would be the case. So I have one last easy question and then I have, to, I have to go to the actual retreat. Okay. Does King Gabriel have some sort of library of books or is there a recommended place to check out books? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, if you come out of the, um, between the rectory and the church, there's that hallway there. Right. There's a bookshelf underneath the windows. And those are, those are free for the taking to be taken, come back, bring them back. Okay. So there's a pretty good selection in there. Um, I know the school has a library, but I'm not sure how that really works. Yeah. But as far as the parish is concerned, you can take any book out of that shelf you'd like, read it, bring it back, no Good problem. Good to know. Okay. Great. All right. Well, thank you. I have to head to Axe Retreat. All right. Well, have a good meeting. Thank you. I'll right, see you later. Great. I think they studied the Bible more grade school and high school religion curriculum. You know, the thing is they probably do, <laughs> but how much should we actually retain? You know, Maybe. I don't really yeah. know. I, I remember memorize, when I was a kid memorizing, um, was, it, was, it, was it the Baltimore Catechism? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we memorized questions. Oh, sure. Answers. Yeah. You um, and me both. I was, I was a student of the Baltimore Catechism too. And I don't remember too much past that. And yeah. then in high school, we were right. When was the Vatican II? When uh, it ended in 65. Okay, well, well, I was in high school from 60 to 64. Mm -hmm. And so um, there was a priest who was obviously very excited about the changes. And, you know, but I, I just remember he was excited about it, and I don't remember anything he said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of mad about it. You know? Well, you know, <laughs> I, I think part of that's because, um, well, okay, so when, when it came to the biblical study, and admittedly, we've kind of uh, um, we've kind of like passed that buck on to a lot of our Protestant brothers and sisters when it comes to interpretation. Um, part of the reason that is because there was such a pendulum swing back in the Middle Ages. So after after the Reformation happened, um, the Church instead of focusing on a, a deposit of faith, which was Scripture, right? We would say sacred Scripture. Um, there was more of an emphasis on the sacraments. Because it was really trying to show a very big, a great distinction between what the Protestants were upholding as sola scriptura and what the Catholic Church understood to be the deposit of faith, which included scripture, but also was, was tradition and magisterium. So the problem was the Jesuits, or I'm sorry, and maybe there's probably a slip there. The problem was the Protestants rejected magisterium and rejected tradition and just maintained sola scriptura. So for 500 years, there's more of emphasis on, well, yeah, it's the hierarchy of the church, it's the teaching authority of the church, 
and it's also the sacraments. That's really kind of the main thing we want to take away. And biblical interpretation is kind of dangerous because you can maybe all interpret things that may not be actually what the church teaches, right? So if you, well, for instance, if you read the Gospel of Mark, just the Gospel of Mark, per se, you may walk away from that thinking, well, God, well, Jesus really wasn't God. I mean, everything in Mark is really more focused on Jesus being a man. And so there's really nothing, not, not a lot in Mark to say that he actually was God. So where do we get this whole idea that God, that Jesus is God? Well, admittedly, you have to read other scripture in order to actually come to that conclusion, not just the Gospel of Mark. But someone who just read that and is a Catholic and they have that interpretation, well, it's, it, it could be dangerous because now you're actually promoting something that the church does not teach. He's not, he's not just man, he's also God. And so it's kind of thought, well, we, we, we'll leave it in the hands of the, of the experts to interpret this for people so they know what the church teaches. Whereas the Protestant view is, well, you need no interpretation, just whatever you, whatever you read and you interpret, that's got to be true. It's like, ooh, well, that, again, that could be a problem. That could be a problem. Um, now, what, what, what you tend to find, though, when it comes to, to biblical interpretation, the church actually has a very broad interpretation of the scriptures. And there's a lot of things that you can actually call yourself a faithful Catholic and hold to be true just by reading the scripture, which could be sometimes contradictory. So like, for instance, um, there's a, I, I think I bring this up before, but there's a great question about, um, well, well okay, the book of Genesis, right? So, okay, do we have to, so as, as a faithful Catholic, do we have to hold that creation lasted only seven days, seven 24 hour periods, and God did all this in, in, in six days? What do we think? Yeah, I get the answer. I would yeah. say no. Yeah. You don't. But if you read just that, if you just read Genesis and said, well, there's no other interpretation, God doesn't say anything else elsewhere saying, oh, by the way, that's just a figurative speech. You know, I'm just, you know, I actually did things over millions of years. Well, some some denominations of, of Christianity would say, well, you can't hold, you can't be called yourself a Christian unless you hold it actually it took six days to break the universe. And not only that, but it's only, the universe is only uh, 5,000 years old. Or 10,000 years old, right? Well, we as Catholics would say, well, no, there isn't, there's, the Bible is not all historical. Some of it is allegorical. And the trick is trying to interpret which is which. So we look at Genesis chapter one and two as a, as a truth. We would say it's definitely true that God was involved with it and God created a lot of these. From God's mind came all these creations. But if you want to say that six days, well, you could hold that and still call yourself Catholic. Or you could say that, well, this is really an interpretation of how God was involved with the creation of all things. And so a 24, it wasn't necessarily a 24-hour period because, well, when was the sun created? Well, that was until the third day. Well, then what was a day before that, right? So we have a more broad interpretation when it comes to certain things because, well, it is an open question. Where the 10,000 years come from? Well, because that was from the time when Adam was created. Because we look at the Bible, look out of all the years together. Like Adam was around for like a thousand years or whatever. Matthew, Matthew's got this genealogy. He does a genealogy, but also the, the, so we're told in like early books of the Bible, like how old each of these people were. And so, but like, you know, for, for instance, uh, Abraham. <clears throat> Abraham was 110. Now, was he actually 110? Or, I mean, maybe, um, but like there, there's people like, like Methuselah. It was told like he was like 2,000 years old. It's like, well, really? <laughs> so how do we, so th now the question is, how do we answer that? Well, the church could say, well, well, if you look at it from the fall, like the, the numbers kept on getting smaller and smaller as time went on. So, well, maybe the effect of the fall was that we had shorter lifespans of each generation. Okay, well, maybe. Or maybe all that really means is that he was really, really, really old right he was wise beyond his years when we talk about 2000 years because also part of this understanding of hebrew tradition and the writings of the hebrew prophets and the, and the, and the people that were writing these things because when they say 2000 years that doesn't necessarily mean 2000 uh, or uh, 365 days times 2000 it was just try to, to uh, try to implement the fact that this person was a very very wise person 
so wise it wasn't actually natural to him. There was some wisdom given to him that was beyond his natural life, right? And so, but you could also hold that maybe Methuselah was 2,000 years old. We would not say as a Catholic, you can still your house as a Catholic, you hold that. When do the Fine. kids move out? <laughs> exactly right, yeah. So, so that's what I'm talking about when we talk about these little interpretations, that the church has more of a broad view than some of our Protestant brothers and sisters. Because there are certain sects today who say like, no, it's not six days and that was it. And the world's 10,000 years old. And then you can start bringing up like, well, what, what do you say about the fossil record? And also, well, their response could be, well, well, God has the power to let first appear that things are older than they actually are, right? He can, he can manipulate us in some way to help us think that or believe that true, but then why would he, right? God does not want to deceive us. And so maybe there's a better interpretation we can actually have based on revealed truth by science and other things. What are these silly arguments of well, what, what happened to the dinosaurs? Yeah, um, you know, right. Were there dinosaurs 10,000 years ago? Sure. And, and it's, you know, it just, it just defies common sense. Yeah, yeah. And, and, that, and that's, the, that's what I'm saying. Like, from a Catholic perspective, we would say, well, it's both and. Fine, if you want to hold that, fine. You can still call yourself Catholic and do that, but there may be a better, a better response or a better answer. To that. And so that's why we can even hold that like things like um, Darwinism is very possible, because regardless of whatever whatever you say the fossil record or all this all this you know development over time, well there had to be something involved with that to make it happen, and we would say that would be God. Because you can't just keep on going back and back and back and say, oh, well, this happened, this and this. Well, there has to be some connector, some, some initiator, some ender and some connector in between that would keep that going. And philosophically speaking, we'd say, well, that makes, it makes sense. There's a, a, a presence that whether you want to call it intelligent design or uh, just the way that God works in nature that causes these processes to happen. Well, that's because process giver, that would be God. Actually, Thomas Aquinas was the one that kind of coined these. He called them five proofs of God's existence, which were rational philosophical arguments to say that there was actually something, a being beyond us that kept everything going in, in motion. It's the unmoved mover understanding of like um, Aristotle or, or back to Augustine. Yeah, it's uncaused cause. Uncaused cause. That's yeah, another another sentence in the num in the num Yeah. So yeah, I, it's a. Uh, that's why these are so we get discussion with like maybe some of our brothers and sisters of the domination like we kind of have more of a broader context and that's probably why the bible wasn't necessarily emphasized as much when we were younger because well uh, maybe even some of the teachers may not have a good understanding either i i know i had a lot of lay teachers so i'm gonna go to grade school god bless them uh but i don't know if they really had the formation that a nun or a priest or you know clergy would have had you know, the theological understanding. So these questions, they would be raised and maybe they wouldn't necessarily have a good answer. So I don't know. I don't know. And I, I never read Acts, but I read the Father, Father Baron, Bishop Baron, yeah. and I, you know, I read the gospel, but I'm, I'm also reading the readings too. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm trawled by what the apostles were doing after yeah. the yeah 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 i mean for uh the whole time the holy strata we were hearing about this the story about the crippled man that was filled the beautiful gate and you know it, it's it's funny because like that's the first time we hear that someone other than jesus has done this or something right and so what that tells us is that yeah this authority was given to his his, his church right that these these bishops these priests that were ordained at the last supper were also given this authority. And so if they were given that authority, could they give it to somebody else? And we it shows what it actually shows is that, yeah, because <laughs> look, we had these other guys. Matthias, this guy was made a, an apostle, a bishop. And then he had the same authority and he could start doing these things. It was like, oh, okay. Um, which is so funny because like a lot of our brothers and sisters who rejected the magisterium of the church, all you have to do is look in Acts and say, well, how do you explain this then, right? Because a lot of the argument comes down to, well, that was for a time. Yeah, the apostles may have had that, but that was it. Because they were given directly by Jesus. It's like, what about Matthias? Well, well, he was still an apostle. Okay. 
Well, what about um, Timothy and Titus? You know, they're also in the Bible too. They were given the same authority and we have record of them doing these crazy. So, I mean, we keep on digging into it. It's like, well, so what's the argument then? Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 I think a lot of it was a reaction, reactionary for 500 years against the Reformation, which is why a lot of our, our, a lot of us Catholics don't have a good understanding of the Bible because there was so much emphasis on other things um, that we didn't really have the opportunity to. Now, I, things may have changed. I know when I was in high school, there was much more emphasis on Bible study. Like for my entire sophomore year, we just studied uh, Christian and Hebrew scripture at CBC. And that was part of the curriculum. Um, I know here in sixth grade, they really concentrate more on the Bible study. So maybe things have changed over the last, you know, you know that could be, I don't know. Um, but I do remember we did talk about that in our, in our high school course and we probably did, we probably touched on it in grade school but you know i don't know if we have i don't know if we actually oh, we opened the bible on occasion um had yeah i know around, right but I, know. but I mean the, the textbooks we had in grade school were just so horrible they were so bad and so i don't i don't know it's hard, I, hard it's hard to remember now i think we did but i can't remember if we did very often you know so yeah i mean so well versed in it how how much do you study it in the seminary i mean is it hours and hours and hours well yeah I mean, so uh we have let's see uh synoptic um john wisdom books tended to um same i mean yeah so we basically have two years worth of studies just a lot like two years worth of classes and studies and the inscription uh, and so, because we, we have to, I mean, part of that's because, well, we're called to preach on this stuff and you can't necessarily preach about it if you don't know what you're talking about. Um, but even then, I mean, we're also told that even with stuff we, when we study, there's still a lot more out there. And so uh, a preacher should always have a very good commentary with them um, and also be open to like other, other forms of commentary on the scriptures. When you were learning, you got to take tests, like. Oh yeah, oh yeah, um, yeah. I mean, just like any any uh, any college level course, sure, you know, master's level, yeah. So yeah, we had yeah, <laughs> we had to pass, them and you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I, I don't know. I think our teachers were very are, were good, um, and so far they're the most challenging because there are just like there's there's so many different ways you can interpret something. And the question you have to ask yourself, what's the best way to interpret this? You could be right that there's other interpretations and you can hold that, but like a lot of our, our understanding from theology has to be in line with reason. And so the question that you really have to ask yourself when you're applying this stuff is what, what's the most reasonable? What makes the most sense? Um, and that's really with anything in theology. When we think about like uh, a lot of these open questions we have in, in, our, in our understanding of the Catholic teaching. So, um, just a couple, I, we may have talked about this before, but when we talk about the assumption of Mary, there's no biblical, that is from the Bible, comes from tradition, but even then there's theological questions like, well, did Mary actually die? That's an open question. You could hold either position. Um, would Jesus need to have come if the fall never happened? You could hold two, two different positions on that and still call yourself Catholic. What's that? Tell me the for that one. Yeah. Um, well, th there's two schools of thought: the Jesuits and the Franciscans. So the Franciscans would hold that even if the fall didn't happen, Jesus still would have become one of us and become man. Now maybe he didn't have to suffer, but he could have still been incarnated. Okay. The Jesuits would say, "Well, no, he wouldn't come because it wouldn't be necessary for him to come." Right, we don't need savings, so therefore he doesn't need to uh, do that. The Franciscan reasoning is that it's better for humanity if Jesus would become one of, one of us, right? So that would be a better thing for us if Jesus would become a, a man. Whereas Jesus was like, well, it's not necessary. You don't we don't have to worry about it because there's no need for it. You could hold both positions. It's still charged. 
Well, part of that is like, we look at the knowledge of Jesus. So Jesus had, uh, well, Father Chris Seiler would argue, he had three uh, levels of knowledge. He had uh, the beatific vision, right? So Jesus didn't have faith. <laughs> it's kind of hard to think about that, right? Jesus was the epitome of all virtues, but he didn't have faith. Because he, he knew. He could see God face to face. He knew that there was a God. He knew because he was. And he saw the face of the Father and the Holy Spirit. So he didn't hate, need faith because he knew that was the case, right? Um, now, include, now, you could say this is part of this, but he also would have angelic knowledge. Meaning that he would know the essence of all things. Right. So for us as humans, it's hard to like if you if I were to ask you, what is the essence of this table? Right. That's hard for us to answer. Because you say, well, it's got four legs. Well, yeah, so is a dog. Okay, well, okay, well, it's made out of metal and wood. Well, but there's a lot of things made out of metal and wood that's how the table have four legs. So to tell you what the essence, the form of it is, a human can't really answer that. You can tell what it's made out of, you can tell how it was maybe put together. You can even tell me who did it, who put it together, but that doesn't necessarily answer the question is what is the essence of this table? You can even tell me what the purpose of it is. Okay, still, that doesn't tell me what the essence of it is. An angel could tell you that. So Jesus had that too. What, it's funny though, what Jesus did not have though, before he was, took on human nature, was experiential knowledge. So in other words, Jesus knew that if I took this hammer and I put, I, I applied this force with this nail, I would drive that nail into the wood. He could probably tell you the physics of it. He could probably tell you the essence of those things and how they all work together and everything about it. But to actually feel the hammer in his hand and feel the vibration of the nail, he wouldn't have done that without a body. And so that's what he gained, for lack of a better word. By becoming human. Huh? Does he, does he, would he need to know that? Or? Well, I mean, if, if God is all omniscient, right, you would say, yeah. And he may have had some understanding of it. You would have knowledge of it, like, he, but he wouldn't necessarily know how to feel what it felt like until he actually took on a body. So it, it's like also like even just emotion. Like God doesn't the spiritual doesn't have emotion that's a faculty of the body and so to like have fear to have hunger god would not have experienced that until he actually had a body right that's one of the mysteries of the faith like well he would have he would have actually had some knowledge because otherwise it wouldn't exist but to actually experience hunger well he couldn't do that without a body so yeah but what that really shows is a deeper connection with humanity that he would even <laughs> he didn't need to but the fact that he did shows his immense love for us and he's, uh, he's wanting to actually get to know us in a better deeper way so yeah it's, it's an interesting discussion um i have my opinion i i kind of hold that i think it, i, th I kind of side with the franciscans and not because I just don't like the Jesuits. It's really just more because I, that, it makes sense to me that God wouldn't get to know us better by taking on a body. So, yeah. Any other questions, comments? I have my question. Great. Okay, I'm reading this book, Prayer by Alphonsus Liguori. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's really good. He makes a comment in here uh, what is necessary, the three conditions necessary for prayer, humility, confidence, and perseverance, okay? And he talks about, I don't think humility, persevering, you have to persevere, you have to approach God humbly. Uh, when he talks about confidence, and he mentions, uh, and James says, uh, those who pray half-heartedly mm. don't expect anything. Mm -hmm. So we have to pray with confidence. Mm -hmm. that, um, and I guess my question is, what is, is confidence the same as uh, hope and trusting in God? Mm -hmm. Trusting okay. God, 
in, in other words, um, hoping. Yeah. So we like just assume that God hears our prayer. Well, we 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 know that God hears our prayer, right? We we know that God always hears our prayers and always answers our prayers. He may not answer in the way we want, but he surely answers them. Um, now, confidence, it's important maybe look at the, the root of that word. Um, the root of that word is fide, and that's Latin for faith. So really what confidence means is cum fide, with trust, right? So someone is confident, they're trusting in something, right? Whether it be their own ability, their own whatever that may be, or trust in God, trust that he's going to hear me and also answer what I'm going to ask, right? And so that's, that's the basis of confidence. Cum fide is really kind of what it comes from, with faith. Um, and so when we're talking about confidence, that, that's really what we're talking about. So hope is a different thing. Hope is... Um, Hope is like a, uh, it's a level of perseverance in the, great, in, 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 the, in the presence of a great obstacle, right? So whenever, when you think about hope is, let's say um, I have a setback in my life, right? But I, I'm still gonna go forward because I know that there's something better there for me that'll help me, that'll actually help me reach my end by getting through this. And that's really what, that's really kind of the classic definition of hope. So it, it's kind of, hope is really a perseverance in the, in the in the in the presence of great difficulty, right? Yeah, and that's somewhat related to courage, but hope is more internal, while courage is more external, right? Okay, so you hope against hope, I guess is what you. Yeah. yeah. You, uh, you hope that you're going. To you hope you're going to go to heaven. Yeah. Uh, even though you've committed sins in your life. Sure. Right? Yeah. But you still hold out there. Oh. Correct. And with one of three theological virtues. Correct. Faith, hope, and sure. love. Yeah. And I think what, see, I think what, what I'm getting from this book is that hope involves trust and confidence. And, and the two, I'm getting the Words. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, there, there's a distinction between the three, right? Uh, charity is a little more easy to recognize compared to the other two, right? Charity is the queen of the virtue. It's really where all these other flow from. Um, and that's not the same thing as love. <laughs> so, uh, charity is is kind of the essence of grace. Is that that's really that's really it's the it's doing for the good of another. That's really charity, right? Um, Hope is uh, uh, it is a perseverance in the face of difficulty. So that, it, okay, even though I have sin on my soul, even though there's these burdens that are keeping me from reaching my end, I'm still going to hope because I know that, that it will pay off in the end, right? And I hope it does. I may not know for sure, but I hope it does, right? Faith is that confidence. It's that actual un, uh, trust that that end is going to be a pain, right? Not on my own doing, but of, of God. That's the supernatural virtue of faith, right? Um, what is it? Uh, what is it Galatians 5? The biblical definition would be, um, it's, it's, uh, it's a belief, belief in things uh, hoped for and um, evidence of things unseen, right? That's kind of the essence. Now, you're right. They, they're, inter, they're not interchangeable, they're, but they're interconnected in a very deep way, right? Which makes sense, because when one virtue grows, the others do too. So, so the deeper your faith and the deeper your trust in God, mm -hmm. and the, and the, and the, deeper, the more you hope, the more confident you're going to be that when you approach God in prayer, right. you have that confidence. Correct. And so they all sort of build on each other? They certainly do, yes. So I can pray with more protection. This is why I like those things, you know, those things that are peaceful. I think, I, th I think they, they like that because one thing they have to raise their trust, but they also have the confidence yeah. that they're going to be in heaven. Somewhere. Right. You know, and, right. And the people they love, right. they're the ones that are going to see them in heaven. Yeah. So, and and, it's, it's, and that's a lot different than presumption, right? 
because presumption is almost like an end in itself. Like I have, I'm there already, right? Where the confidence is more, I'm on the road getting there, but I know I'm not there yet. I'm still going to trust that God's going to provide for me. Right? So, yeah. yeah. So they're all sort of connected. Oh, very much so. And, and they all feel them. Right? Exactly. All the virtues do. So not only the theological, but also the cardinal virtues. So that when, when one grows, the other one grows as well. And it, it's funny because like some people might say, well, what happens if they contradict each other? Well, the problem is they can't, right? So if you're growing in faith, you're also growing in hope, charity, prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude, right? And this is growing forward to you, growing the other. I mean, so when one grows, the other one's going to grow too. Now, one may be primary for you, right? And you may be lacking in others, but they grow together, if that makes sense. Yeah, right. and, and the more, so the more you pray, uh, the more you trust, the more you hope, and the more confident you become mm -hmm. that your prayers are being answered. Yeah. So one thing, and uh, you can reach that point where, even though we're not there yet, uh, we can sense it. <laughs> yeah, and I think you bring up another good point, Paul, because I mean, what we have to look at too is what is the point of prayer, right? Because prayer, I think we often look at prayer as like, uh, we look at God as the genie. That I go to prayer because I need something from you, Lord. Come on, let's go. I need you. I need you now, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but prayer is really meant for us to understand in a deeper way the will of God and to accept it, right? So let's not say we can't pray for things. I can't. I mean, here's the thing. I can, I can pray that um, uh, that um, my prisoners are holy, <laughs> and that's a good prayer to pray. Pray, right? Um, but here's the thing, I don't have a lot of uh, control of that, right? But what, what maybe with, with the answer to that prayer may be an acceptance of the fact that some of my parishioners will be holy, but not all of them will, right? And so maybe then my prayer changes from, okay, now I need, I need uh, perseverance or to do better or revelation to try and get more people to become holy. To be a better instrument of that grace, and so that's 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 the whole point of prayer. So first, of all, to form ourselves better to God's will, and also to grow in those virtues that we need to to become holy ourselves, to make others holy. Right? Yeah. So yeah, good. Definitely. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for coming, guys. All right. Well, thank you. All right. Thanks. Nice seeing you. Hi, my name is Paul.